Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate you being here. May the good Lord bless you. We have visitors here. We're glad you're visiting with us today. Always glad to have visitors to come in and be with us in our services. And you that's listening out in the radio listen to us, most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be a real inspiration. We're having somewhat a holiday weekend, also next weekend, but we still have a good attendance. And we appreciate you uh, coming in today, and we appreciate you just tuning in out in the radio listening audience. So you get on your phone, call a friend, have them to do likewise, so I believe we can be a blessing to them. Now, if you have your Bible, you take it and turn, would you please, to the book of Judges, chapter 7, or chapter 6, rather, page 295. Page 295, the book of Judges, chapter 6. I want you to turn there as we read the Word of God. I would like to say this, that... You can get this message and this beautiful song and all the singing today on the cassette tape number 236. Tape number 236. Now, if you don't get all the message any Sunday morning by having maybe been cut off the air at 12, when we're not, not quite through with our message some Sunday mornings, we may be cut off from the station, but we still have the message and the music on tape. You can get the full sermon by writing in and getting the tape. And these tape are three dollars each, and the gift is huge. Help to pray our radio expense. And so I hope you'll write in and get our tape. We have some two hundred and more than thirty listed. We have uh, the list of them here. We'd be glad to send you a list of our cassette tape. And then we have our brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour. We're planning a tour for March of next year. We hope by this time all the up evil over there will be settled. Everything will be fine. And we're setting up one of the greatest tours we have thus far. Planning to spend eight days in Israel and two days in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. I'm looking forward to going to Switzerland. I've been to the Holy Land 12 times, but I've never gone to Switzerland yet in our tour. And I'm looking forward to that trip. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. And I know many of you have never taken a trip of this type in some degree recent time and age. It would be a real, real trip of a lifetime. If you'd like to have a brochure on the tour, you write in and get it. I'll send you a brochure. You may say, now, Preacher Edwards is a little early to be planning the trip. No, no, you need to get your name on the list. You'll have them now until next March to get ready. In case something should happen between now and then, you want to get your little down payment refunded back to you, you can. And then if things should uh, get worse over there, then of course we won't go. We're not going to carry you into a territory where we think it's dangerous. And so you pray with us and think with us about it. We'll trust God for the tour. And we believe we'll have a successful one. We're looking forward to it. Remember that mailing address. It's Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. And so you let me hear from you. Now remember the daily broadcast. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, then you tune into this station where you're now listening each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday, and you can get the daily broadcast. And I hope if you're not getting the broadcast that you will tune in and get the broadcast. It'll be a blessing to you. I'm going to speak to you today on this subject. The man that wanted to be dead sure. Now, there's some things you need to be dead sure about. And this man wanted to be dead sure about what he was about to do to the glory of God. And you need to be dead sure about certain things in your life. I remember the story of the school teacher in her classroom. She said, I want all the students in this room to draw a picture of something and turn it in. So they started drawing and of course the pictures came in, they passed their papers in, and finally shut all the papers in except one little boy. And he seemed to be so very busy drawing whatever he was drawing. And they kept waiting on him, and they said, uh, 
Sonny boy, you need to get your paper in, said, you're holding up the works here, said, uh, what are you drawing anyway? He said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. Why, they said, well, nobody has ever seen God, he said, nobody knows what God looks like. He said, you'll know in a few minutes when I finish with this picture. So a lot of people, you know, they have idea they can do things. And so he figured they'd know what God looked like when he finished that drawing. And so we need to be dead sure in what we're doing. And this man said he wanted to be sure that he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. Now in the book of Judges, chapter 6, page 295 is where I'm reading from in the original Schofield Reference Bible, verses 37 through, 30, through 40. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, Behold, I will put out a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. For I rose up early on the morning, and thrust the fleece together, and wring the dew out of the fleece, and a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, let not, thine, let not thine be anger, let thine anger be hard against me, and I will speak but this once. Let it be proved, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God sowed, that did so that night, but it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Now here we find a man that God had called to deliver Israel. For seven long years, they had been under the dominion of the Mennonites. And the Mennonites had moved in in great swarms of troops and people. And had just about robbed them of all of their resources and food they had to eat. And they were just about on starvation. And they were looking to God to deliver them and to take care of their situation. They had prayed for seven years for this deliverance. And finally a time came for God to do something about it. Now the worship of Baal was prevalent there in the land. And of course to oppose the worship of Baal meant death, certain death. And so they were in a bad predicament. And they wanted deliverance. And they stayed before God seven years. And finally God came to the rescue and said, I will give you deliverance. And through the sovereignty of God, he chose a man by the name of Gideon. Now this man, Gideon, it was a humble man. The Bible says in Judges chapter 6 and verse 15, But my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. When the angel came and said, Gideon, God has sent me on a mission to inform you that you are chosen to deliver his people from the hands of the Midianites, and you are the man for the job. And so Gideon said, I'm, I'm a poor man. I came out of a poor family and out of, the, out of my father's house, out of the tribe of Manasseh. Why should I be called to do a job like this? I'm unworthy. Now he had called the God. He, God had called him and gave him a promise. And of course, this man Gideon heard the promise of God. God had given him a promise that if he do certain things, of course, he would not came upon him. And chapter 6 and verse 34, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now without the Spirit of God, we are hopeless. We can get nothing done without the presence of God's Holy Spirit. That's why we need to cry to God for the fullness of God's Spirit day after day. And so his first job was to go to the inn and tear down the altars of Baal. Now he had a pretty big job to perform. And he had to go in and tear down those altars of Baal and Baal was more or less a devil worship, and he had to go and destroy their altars. Now they were worshiping Baal, and, and that had to be done. Many times a man of God is called upon to do a job that seemed to be very difficult. Now that's why this man Gideon said, Lord, I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that this is what you want me to do. He said, Lord, I want to put out the fleece. I'll put this fleece out and... In the morning, if there's dew on this fleece and none on the ground, then I'll know that you want me to go and do this job. 
And so he put out the fleece and next morning he went out and looked at it and it was soaked with dew. There was no dew on the ground around the fleece. He said, Lord, don't be angry with me. I want to be dead sure about this thing, God. I, I want to know that I'm in your will and that you're sending me to do this tremendous job. He said, Lord, I'm going to put out the fleece again tonight. And if you really want me to go and do this job, I want dew to be all around that fleece on the ground and none on the fleece. And so he got up the next morning and it was bone dry, that is the fleece, and dew all around on the ground. He said, Lord, that's it. Lord, I'll go and do the job that you have called me to do. And this great nation, this army that he had to go in and cast out of the land of Israel and defeat was the army of the Midianites and they had 120,000 men in their army. God said, Gideon, I want you to call your troops together and go forward and conquer the Midianites. And this man, Gideon, called together 32,000 troops. God said, Gideon, I want you to know that's too many. You don't need that many troops to go in and whip that army. I want you to talk to those men. If there's any force in the crowd, any faint-hearted, tell them to go back home. Tell them to go back home. We don't need them. And so Gideon went out and talked to his troops. He said, if there's any of you fellows afraid and you're faint-hearted, then you go back home to your family. 22,000 soldiers turned their backs upon Gideon and went back home. That only left him with 10,000. God said, Gideon, 10,000 men are too many to go and engage in combat 120,000 Mennonites. I want you to carry these men down to the river. And by the way, I have visited this very spot where Gideon carried these men to lap up the water out of the river. Some of the most beautiful fig trees I've ever seen grew there in that area. I visited some few years ago on one of my tours to Israel. Gideon took those 10,000 men and went down the river. And God said, Gideon, I want you to tell those men to get out and drink out of that river. They were very thirsty out of that stream of water. Those men got down and began to drink. And we find that 9,700 buried their faces in that water. They were so thirsty, they just buried their faces and drank the water. But 300 of those soldiers did not bury their faces in the water. They reached down and picked the water up in their hands and lapped it out of their hands like a dog would lap water. At the same time, they kept their eyes focused on the enemy. They did not take their eyes off of the enemy. They would reach down and up would come that water that lap it like a dog, never dropping their eyes from the sight of the enemy. The other men, 9,700, buried their faces in that water. God said, Gideon, send those men, the 9,700, back home. You don't need them. I want you to take 300 men that lapped up water like a dog, and they would be the ones to carry into battle. Now Gideon knew he had to be dead sure about this business, but he knew if God was in it, he'd be victorious. And so Gideon said, Men, all of you men that buried your face in the water, get up and go home. We don't need you. Gideon said, All of you men that lapped up water like a dog out of your hand, I want you to line up over here. I want three companies, a hundred in each company, I want you 300 men to get ready. We're going out and engage the enemy in combat. Now you had 300 men facing 120,000. I want you to think about that. Now if God is not with these men, they're sure to be defeated. They're sure to be wiped out if God is not with them. But if God is with them, all right, they can do the job. Now Gideon said, all right, I want you men to get together, 300 of you. I want you all to be like-minded. They were all great men of faith. The Bible said they were as one man with one sword. They had complete unity. There were 300 men with complete unity that believed alike, that greed alike, that had faith alike. And there they stood like the rock of Gibraltar. You can take a church with 300 men all believing alike, 
solid in unity. And you could accomplish more for God than you could a church with a thousand members all crossed up and grumbling and griping and growing about different things and divided. God blesses unity. Now, I don't want to sound redundant, but I've mentioned this before, but it illustrates a point. Now, on Sunday morning, we we'll always have new listeners, especially out in the radio listed audience. And this is a good illustration illustrating how God's people need to remain in unity and move forward in unity. When I was in the army in World War II, and we were fighting the Germans in France and in that area, our company commander would said, all right, men, we must make an attack tonight. Our objective is to pass through this woods ahead of us, cross the little river, and take the town beyond the river. But he said, men, listen to me. This is very important. He said, I want unity among you soldiers. He said, I want you to back each other up. Remain united. He said, if the Germans divide you and get this little platoon cut off and this one cut off and this squad cut off, they'll annihilate you one at a time and you'll be wiped out. But he said, men, stay united. Protect each other. Do your job. Move forward. We are gathered together in the little village beyond the woods and the river. And beloved, as long as we stayed together, we can move forward and conquer our objective. But some of the companies on our left, they got divided and cut off. And the Germans conquered them a platoon or a squad at a time and wiped out as many as a company at a time. Because it did not remain united in their conquest, in the job that they were called to do. Now that's very important. In God's work, in God's house, you must be united. You must not have any division if you expect the blessings of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 13, listen to this verse. When the singers were as one, then the house was filled with glory. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 13. When the singers were as one, the house was filled with glory. Now that can be applied to all of God's people and whatever they are doing. And so Joshua said, men, it's time to move forward. There's power and unity. You men are together. You three men, you 300 men, you three companies of 100 men, men each know what our objective is. You know what to do. And you're solid. And I want you to charge the enemy, destroy the enemy, and take the territory. That's your assignment. And he said, men, there's three things I want you to do. Now listen carefully, he said. I want you to do these three things. In verse 16, he divided the 300 men in the three companies. He put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and a lamp within the pitchers. Now that seemed very strange. Gideon said, men, I want you now, you three companies, I want you to put a trumpet in every man's hand. You must have that trumpet. In addition to that, I want you to put an empty pitcher in every man's hand and put a lamp within that pitcher. Now that's God's way. God's way is not always man's ways. God does some peculiar things and things that seem strange in the eyes of the intelligence of this world as we serve Him. Not many wise are called, God said, but God has chosen the foolish things the world can found the wise. And he said, you take the trumpets, the empty pitchers, and the lamp. Now, why use a trumpet? A trumpet in the Bible is a tip of a testimony. You are not going to accomplish anything for God unless you have a good, sound testimony to the glory of God. That trumpet there uh, signifies a testimony. You have a testimony for God Almighty. And if you ever expect to accomplish anything for God, you must have a good testimony. Secondly, the empty pitchers. Why the empty pitchers? There was a man who had an empty pitcher in his hand and a trumpet. That empty pitcher there is symbolic of a man emptying himself up that he might be filled with God's Spirit to the glory of God. As long as you're full of self, You'll never mount anything for God. You must be emptied up to the glory of God that the Holy Spirit of God might control you every step of the way. 
So the Bible says we have vessels. And they had the vessels, the pitcher. And that pitcher was empty. And you must empty yourself up of this world that you might be filled with the good things of God, the Spirit of God especially. Number three, he said on the inside of that pitcher, I want you to put a lamp. Now why put a lamp on the inside of a pitcher? That lamp is symbolic of the Word of God. The Bible said God's Word is a lamp on thy feet and a light on thy pathway. So in order to be effective and be used of God like God wants you to be used, you must empty up self and take on the Word. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now if you want to be powerful for God and usable for God, then you must meditate upon God's Word, read the Word, memorize the Word, get the Word on the inside of you. You must do that. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. As long as you're so full of the world and so full of self, you have no room for the Word of God in your heart and life. Remember, you must empty up yourself. Put yourself on the altar, as it were, as a living sacrifice to the glory of God. And then he tells us here what to do. He tells them what to do. He said, men, take your pitchers, take your lamps, take your trumpets. And then he tells them, now I want you to blow those trumpets and break those pitchers and let those lights shine. Now in order to be a real blessing, there may come a time in your life when God will break you. When something will happen to you to humble you. To bring you to your knees. God may permit something to come into your home and your life. That will cause you to spend much time in prayer. That will cause you to weep. The lady called me this morning down here at Coleman. Told me about a terrible thing happened in her family. Her heart was heavy. She said, preach, I don't believe in what happened in my family. I don't believe in that. I, it's not right. Well, God may allow sometimes things to happen to make us better Christians, to make us more humble, to get us on our knees before God, that we might be better used of God. And so the breaking may have to come. A lot of times Christians get kind of full of pride and heady, hard, and high-minded and begin to look at themselves and what they do and God may just have to break them, bring them right down. I don't know the way and the means God will use to break you or me, but He knows. God knows exactly what to touch in our lives to humble us and bring us before Him where we should be. There may be some of you right now in the radio listening audience, God has broken you. You're a broken individual today and you're born again believer. And you can't understand why you're broken and in the situation you're in. God may be breaking your picture that your light can shine. That picture has to be broken if that light is really going to shine. We have a lot of church members today. Their light's not shining. It's still on the inside of the picture. They're still full of self and they're not going to let the light be seen till God breaks the picture. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever loses life for my sake shall find it. So if God breaks your pitcher, you're not a loser. You lose your life in this world. In order that you might live unto God, you might find it in the Lord. The apostle Paul said, I die daily. Now this man Gideon said that they, they must use the pitchers, the lights and trumpets. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works that God might be glorified. That's what he said in the blessed book. This man Gideon who wanted to be dead sure about what he was doing, they had great confidence in his men and wanted them to follow his leadership and they had great confidence in him. In verse 17, he said to them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. 
Now what did their pastor tell them? What did the man of God say to them? He said, I want you to look at me. As we go out to engage the enemy in combat, you watch me and what I do, I want you to do. Every preacher should be an example to the flock. And the flock should be able to follow his leadership as he follows the Lord. The apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Get in the under shepherd, follow God. He said, you follow me and what I do, there you do. Now the disciples followed Jesus for three and a half years before he left them and went back to heaven and commanded them to go out on the own. Now they must have great faith and courage to do a job like this. God can't use weaklings and crybabies necessarily. God needs strong Christians. In verse 21, And there stood every man in his place around about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. Now these 300 men, are you listening? These 300 men had a position to fill, a place to stand, a job to do. And the Bible said every one of them stood in his place. You as a Christian have a job to do. You have responsibility. And you ought to find yourself in your place where you should be on the Lord's day especially and in serving God throughout the week. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now we are members of the body of Christ, part of the body of Christ, members in particular, and every man has a responsibility toward God and toward his fellow man, and you need to realize that. We are in one body, and each member must be in his place. There's a job to be done. It might not be easy, but there's a job to be done. Many years ago, yonder in London, England, there's a man by the name of Tom Collins. Tom Collins felt led to go to Africa, or Kenya, as a missionary. And so he told his friends, his relatives, he said, God is calling me as a missionary to Kenya. And uh, he applied to the board to get permission to go and see if the board wouldn't send him. They checked him out physically and found out he had cataracts on his eyes and he had bad lungs. They said, sir, we're sorry. We can't send you as a missionary. You can't survive in that desert country. You just couldn't make it, my brother. And we can't send you. That man had such a burden on his heart until he said, if you don't send me, I'll go on my own. That man went on his own to Kenya. And there he was laboring in that desert and seemed to getting nowhere. One day he was riding on a jeep out in a desert and got stalled or stuck in the hot sand and couldn't get it out. He knew unless he got that jeep out of that hot sand, he would die there in that desert of the hot sun. He got on his knees. He prayed for God to help him get that Jeep out of that hot sand. And then he got off his knees and crawled back in that Jeep, cranked it, and out it went. There's a man, one of the natives, walked up hiding behind a rock. And that native said, uh, white man, said, I, I saw what happened there. I can hardly believe what I saw. I knew you'd never get out of that sand, but I saw you on your knees your hands raised toward heaven. Now I believe in your God. And that was his first convert in that desert, in that country. That man remained there for 30 long years and became seriously ill. And they brought him back home to die. On his deathbed, they said, uh, Tom, how many people did you win there on the mission field during the 30 years you were there? He said, three a four, and he died. When they buried that man shortly thereafter, there came some of the leaders, the chiefs, leaders of the tribes came to a, a mission field in that particular area. And they came in, they said, our witch doctors have betrayed us. Said, we want a man, we want somebody like the man that used to be here, the man Tom Collins. Can you send us somebody like Tom Collins? And they sent missionaries in that area. In a matter of time, there was a church there with more than a thousand converts, thousand members, all because of one grain of wheat fell in the ground and died. And out came many. Tom Collins spent 30 years in that desert, 
one, three, or maybe four people to God. But after his death, because of what he accomplished during those 30 years, a church with more than a thousand members sprang up in that area and began to carry on for God. Sometimes it may seem little what you're doing, but if God called you to do it, do it. You know what God may do with your efforts. God wants you to be faithful. And so they had great faith in God. He was a humble man. And this man Gideon, a humble man, a spirit-filled man. And they broke those pitches, blew those trumpets, and the enemy fled. And they defeated that army of 120,000 and the rescued Israel. We must be humble in serving God. Several years ago, it was my privilege to run a meeting for Dr. Harold Seidler in the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville when he was in the old building. Had a building, his first building, something similar to this. In fact, this building was patterned after his old building. And many had built his building, built this one. I ran a meeting for him and, and God gave us a good meeting. That was in the early years of the ministry of the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville. And I heard this story. And far as I know, it is a true story. People begin to come into that church over there in droves. Some driving a model, some uh, Chevrolet, some Cadillacs. Men of all walks of life coming in. Meal workers, farmers, truck drivers, businessmen, bankers and what coming into that church. Dr. Seitler got up before the congregation and he said, Dear people, God has blessed us beyond measure. And I want us to stay humble. I want us to be an humble people. He said, I want every man in this church, if you will, to come down here and crawl on your knees here at this altar and let's get low before God. Those men begin to march forward. There were truck drivers, cotton mill workers, farmers, office men, uh, political leaders and whatnot. They came down and got on their knees and crawled on their knees and hands like a dog in that altar and began to weep. Brother Seitler said, God's been so good to us and so humble us. We want to be and bless us. We want to be humble before God and keep his blessings. And Brother Seitler was kneeling on the platform to lead in prayer. And he felt some, felt a hand touch his shoulder. And he thought it was his song leader, Brother Harold Taylor. And he turned to see what Brother Taylor wanted. And there wasn't a soul behind him, not a, no one standing behind him. Yet he felt the hand of someone on his shoulder. God allowed an angel to touch that man and put his stamp of approval upon what he was doing. And the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina is one of the greatest Baptist churches in America today. And Brother Seidler is one of the greatest pastors. They have some of the finest Christians and hundreds and hundreds on the mission field they're supporting. And what a wonderful job for God. And they're still humble like they were in that day. And God is still blessing. Gideon was a humble man. He wanted to be sure. And when he found out for sure what God wanted, he set out and did the job. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it and help us to be humble before thee. And help us realize when we know what we should do to do it. And trust thee to give the results. And our Father, I speak for everyone in this building today. There may be somebody here unsaved. Maybe a backslider here backslidden on God maybe somebody here that needs to join this church and I pray God that you'll have you in the invitation maybe somebody here needs to come forward to rededicate their life whatever needs to be done Father it's in your hands now I pray that you'll be glorified in Christ's name Amen now while Joan plays an invitation number listen to me give me attention if you're in this building and you're unsaved you want to get saved, come down here. We'll help you to God. If you die in your sins, you're just certain to burn in hell as you listen to my voice today. You may say, preach, I don't believe in hell. That doesn't change it. There's a hell anyway, whether you believe it or not. You need to come and get saved. If you're here and you knew God at one time and you're backslidden on God, you need to come forward and be reconciled back to the Lord and His fellowship. Would you come? Anyone like that? Maybe you're here and you're looking for a church home and you believe Northside is where God wants you. Then would you come? Or for any other reason, would you come? While John plays, won't you come right now while others pray? You and you alone know whether God spoke to you or not. And you and you alone know whether you need to come or not. The responsibility is upon you. I've delivered my soul. I've given you the message God laid on my heart. Now, what are you going to do about it?
while we wait, we're going to give you ample time to respond. How about it? Come on. Come on. It's terrible to die and go to hell. Be awful to be left here to rapture when Jesus comes. If you're not saved, that could be your case. Would you come? One of men wants to die, and after that's the judgment. Would you come? The longer you put off salvation, the harder your neck and heart will become, and harder it will be for you to come to God. You're not careful, you finally go on, the Spirit of God quit dealing with you, and you're bound for hell. God have mercy. I hope that won't happen to anyone in this church today or in the radio listening audience. 